so there's homework this Wednesday, homework next Wednesday, and then exam next Thursday. All right. And the projects are all posted. And they've actually been up there for a little while, I think. So as it is, yeah. Is he in class? Yeah. In class, just like last time. Um, so what was I going to say? So the projects are up there. They're posted. Um, so obviously you don't need to select. Well, you need to select one, but you don't need to tell me about it. I'll figure it out. And that's going to be due the last day of class. All right? You seem to do the opposite of that. That's good. All right. So we are starting a new topic finally. Whoa, got lots of talks open here. We've got to close some of these things. All right, so, um, and I got my pointer working again, I think, yeah. So this is what we're going to start talking about today. So, um, maybe we should put it in projection mode. That'd be good. All right. So at this point, I think you can agree that we've, we've beaten this problem pretty much to death. <coughs> so it's a linear algebraic equation. It's going to be a major focus, obviously, in the second exam. Um, and so now we want to move to sets of equations that are actually not linear. Okay? And so we're going to write those kind of equations like this. So we don't know, like if they're linear, that are written like this, but if they're not linear, that it's going to Let's say it's a single, let's say you have a single variable x, this would be a single function, a single unknown. You don't know what the function f is until I give you the problem. This just indicates it's not linear. If it's linear, I'd write it like this. Okay? So this would be a single nonlinear equation and a single unknown x, and we want to solve it. Okay? Solving this equation will prove more challenging than solving these. Because it's the nature of equations when they're nonlinear, they're much harder to solve than linear equations. Okay? So I'm going to start off by introducing this concept of equation systems. So you might have a single equation and a single unknown, or you might have five equations and five unknowns, whatever. We'll only be talking about systems that are square, meaning the same number of equations as unknowns. Okay. I'm going to introduce the first method. All the methods to solve these equations we're going to talk about are so-called iterative methods. By an iterative method, it means you guess the answer, and then it goes through an algorithm and gives you a new guess that you use again and you just go around and around. Okay? So we're going to talk about three different iterative methods and we're going to, I'm going to introduce what an iterative method is to begin with. And today we'll talk about the first, but the least effective iterative method, which is called fixed point iteration. Okay? And then I'll illustrate these with three or four or five examples. I don't remember exactly. Okay? And I'll give you a little bit of theory for each of these methods explaining when they work. Okay. So by work, well, always we get the internet methods, but, but by work you mean it converges to the right answer. You know, you've got this iteration taking place, you'd like it to actually solve the real problem. And you'd like it to do it fast. Right? So if you had a method that got to the right answer in three iterations, that'd be a lot better than it took 300 iterations. So speed matters, we'll talk about that. Alright. So turn off the lights briefly and like the right before, if you don't mind. All right, so this is what we're talking about, which I wrote on the board. So we got a, in this case, I'm depicting this to be a single nonlinear equation and a single unknown. Okay. And in generally speaking, there's not going to be an analytical solution to this problem. You know, depending on the function f, there might be. But pretty much the only analytical solution that we know is for like a quadratic equation, for example. But this is, in general, this can be an arbitrary nonlinear function f. And again, when I write it like this, I'm just telling you that the function is nonlinear. I'm not telling you what the function is yet. I'll tell you what the function is every time I give you an example. Okay. So generally speaking, we're not going to be able to solve this analytically, so we have to come up with numerical techniques to solve it. That's what these iterative methods I'm talking about are. Okay. By solution, obviously, we mean something like this. If you find a value x that is equal to s, and you plug that value s into the function equals 0, that's a solution. Right. Um, the thing is, there might be more than one solution. So if you have, you know, a linear algebraic system and it's it's nice, right? Like the matrix is square and it's full rank, it's invertible, and all that. There's only going to be one answer, right? Um, but for a nonlinear system, 
of equations or a single nonlinear equation, you might have more than one answer. So here's a, here's a problem you obviously know. So a quadratic equation. That's a nonlinear function. Maybe I should explain why it's nonlinear. It's nonlinear because you have x squared. Okay? So anytime you have something like x, you know, a power of x or 1 over x or a nonlinear function of x like log of x, e of x, those are all nonlinear functions. Most of the problems we deal with in chemical engineering are, are going to be nonlinear. So if you were to write out models and systems and you want to solve them, generally they'll be nonlinear. Not always, but usually. So I have to work usually when I'm, I want to come up with a linear problem, I have to work at it. If I want to come up with a nonlinear problem, it's usually very easy for me. Okay. So I, I guess what I want to tell you is nonlinear equations are the rule, not the exception. If anything, the linear equations are the exception. Okay. All right, so if we looked at this equation, you can plug this in a quadratic equation, you see these are two solutions. Okay? So one equation, it has two solutions. Alright? Um, there might be no solution to the equation, right? So here's an here's equation that has no solution. Right? There's no value of x where e dx equals minus 1. Okay? So, you know, the solution may not exist, or even if it does exist, it may not be unique. So we'd like to understand when that's going to be the case. And I gave you this toy example here because like, you can easily see these as solution. In general, you know, we're not going to be able to easily find the solution by hand. All right. Now, you guys have never had Professor Munson, right? He's teaching the other section of 361. Nice guy. And he likes thermodynamics, right? So he made me promise, because I don't, I don't do many thermal problems, he made me promise I do some thermal problems. Okay, so I said, okay, I'll do some thermal problems. So you guys, are in thermo one now, okay? And you know I should know this obviously, but if you if you guys done equations of state in that, okay? Have you done fluid phase equilibrium in that? Okay. Well, we'll see that in a minute. But so you may have seen this equation of state, right? Everyone knows the most famous equation of state for for a gas is the ideal gas law, right? So if you have a nice gas at low pressure, then it usually will follow the ideal gas law. But if you either have a naughty gas or you have a gas at high pressure, <laughs> it'll deviate from the ideal gas law. And so you see the Van der Waals equation of state, for example. You guys cover that? Okay, so this is the this is one of the well-known equations of state that is um, for deviations from ideal gas behavior called the Rydlick Wong. I guess you've seen it because I see you shaking your head. Okay. All right, and so in this equation of state here, we have a couple of parameters, right? And these A and B depend on what gas you're talking about. So every gas has two different parameters, A and B, and we'll work them up in a table. But P is the pressure. I don't bother giving you the units of everything. Obviously, you have to have a consistent set of units. Okay. P is the pressure. P is the molar volume. T is the temperature. R is the gas constant, obviously, in correct units. Okay. So if we look at this equation, um, you, you can immediately see this is a nonlinear equation in B. Right? So consider this problem. I, you find the constants A and B for the gas of interest to you. You find the gas constant, no problem there. I give you the pressure and temperature. I want you to calculate B. Okay. That means you have to solve this equation for B, and it's not obvious how to do it, I don't think. So if I were to give you B and calculate the pressure, that's a pretty easy problem, obviously. You just crank it out. If you want to solve for B, it's not so easy. Okay. It's not clear that, um, I'm trying to see if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to work hard at this, you could probably formulate this. No, you could just be a cubic, right? I'm trying to see, could I make this a quadratic equation? The answer is no. Because I have to multiply across the equation by this and this, that'd make a cubic in B, and so no, no quadratic either. All right. So we'd like to we'd like to solve a problem. We'd like to be able to solve this for B. Okay. And generally speaking, when you get a complex set of equations that look like this, you don't even think can you manipulate them and solve them analytically. So if I saw an equation like this, I, I would that's why I just thought of it just now. I wouldn't normally even think, let's see if I can manipulate this to be some other equation I can solve analytically. I would just solve it right away numerically in that way. Which I'll teach you how to do, obviously. Alright, so there's an example of one equation, one unknown, right? One single equation, the unknown is B. Um, generally, for most problems of interest, at least lots of them, you're going to have more than one equation, you're going to have more than one unknown. Okay. So it's going to be a system like this. Okay. So we have functions. Where do these functions come from? It matters what problem. 
I'm about to give you a problem. I kind of thought you guys had fluid phase equilibrium, so anyway, I'll go through fluid phase equilibrium for you. Um, so this would be a set of equations you get from thermodynamic uh, uh, relations. It could be from material and energy balances, it could be from momentum balances, or whatever. Okay. So we have n equations. So this is the first equation here. Okay. It potentially involves all the unknowns. So we have n equations. We have n unknowns, okay, which is what we're always going to have for what I talked about. And so this function here, I, you don't know what it is, you just know it's nonlinear, and potentially it depends on all those variables, all n of them. It might just depend on a subset of them, but generally speaking, it can depend on them all. Then you have a second function that can depend on all the variables until you finally get down to n. Okay? This is very cumbersome to write. This is the scalar form. It's like writing ax plus b, where you say, you know, put out all the elements of a, it's painful to write it that way. So we prefer to write it like this. Okay. So we define a vector x. It's all the unknowns stacked in a vector, as usual, no surprise there. And now, instead of a matrix A here, this system's not linear, so matrix doesn't make any sense, we're going to create something called a vector function. So we're going to put all these functions in a vector and define a bold face that's called a vector function. Each component of that is a function. Okay. And then we're going to be able to write this set of equations like this. Right. So you have this vector function. And, it, and the vector function depends on x, which is this set of variables. So this is an equivalent way of writing that. Okay? Just it's much more convenient to write it this way. All right. So if we have a <coughs> vector set of equations like this, then a solution means a vector, right? If I want to find a solution to this equation, I need to find a vector x. And I've said it's some vector s for solution. That when I substitute this into the, all these sets of equations, they're all zero. Okay. But this is not very complex. <laughs> so it's like, what does the solution mean? It means I found an x that solves the problem. Right? I found a set of x values called s1, s2, s3, all the way down to sn. And when I substitute that x vector into the set of functions, it makes every one of those functions zero. It's a solution. Might be more than one. Okay? Might be more than one solution, but that would at least be one solution. All right. So again, the problem might be, might have a solution. The solution might be unique. It might have a solution. Might, but it might have more than one, or might have no solution at all. Okay. So if you pose the problem well, and the problem has physical meaning, it'll usually have a solution. Okay. Like if you have a problem and you write out material balances and it has no solution, something's probably wrong because mass is conserved. There should be a solution to that. Okay. Um, but there's no guarantee the solution will be unique. Okay. There's many problems. Chemical engineering have multiple solutions. Nothing wrong with that. So usually we're not going to worry about the fact there's no solution, because we're going to assume we've written out equations where there are solutions. Okay. All right, well, I guess I have to um, explain that fluid phase equilibrium to you. All right. So what have you covered so far in thermal? Can you show me in real quick? I mean, in a nutshell, like the three or four major topics. You've got, you've got equations of state. Uh, Oh, like, okay. All right. Carnot efficiency and that kind of stuff. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, I guess it's in thermo too, which is, this is one of the challenges in this class, right, is that usually I used to, I used to do all kinetics problems, and I realized that you guys have net kinetics. So I, I thought you had, well, whatever. All right. So fluid phase equilibrium. I better draw a picture here. Okay. Think of the problem like this. You have a vessel. Let's say it's closed. Okay? You've got liquid here, and you've got vapor there. Okay? And what's going to happen after a long period of time, there's going to be a, there's going to be an equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor phases in this tank or whatever you want to call it. Okay? And this equilibrium is going to be described by a set of equations that, let me see what we used to do for the gas phase. We're going to write equations of the state basically for the gas phase and for the, um, oh, we're assuming a gas phase is ideal. OK, so the usual assumption when you do this fluid phase equilibrium, here's what you normally want to do. Someone either gives you the composition, so we're going to assume a binary mixture. Okay? So that means down here, there's two mass or mole fractions, doesn't matter. Okay? You got to call a mass or mole fraction. 
And uh, we only need to worry about one, really. I mean, we know this is true, right? So someone might give me the mole fractions of the two components in the liquid, and I want to calculate what the mole fractions are in the vapor. They're not the same. Okay. So I might want to calculate the mole fractions up here. Okay. Or someone might give me the mole fractions of the two components in the vapor phase, and I want to calculate what they are in the liquid. The question is, how do you do those calculations? You, you exploit the fact that these two phases have to be in equilibrium. That's called fluid phase equilibrium. Okay. And then you can set right out a set of equations to do it. So I'm going to write the equations, but um, I'll do my best to explain them. But I mean, if you haven't had that, be that obvious to you. So I'll probably, go, I'll probably go just go through it quickly. Because it won't matter how much time I spend, you won't completely understand it if you haven't had the class. All right. So. All right. So do you guys at some point do Routes Law? Yeah. OK. All right, so let's think about that. <laughs> Turn the lights back on. I'm trying to reach you people. OK. All right. So if you look at this equation here, you may have seen this thing, especially if you have no, just pretend this gamma is 1. This gamma is something called the activity coefficient. It takes into account the liquid phase is non-ideal. Okay, But you might recall, Routh's law looks something like this. As you say, you've seen it. Y1P equals X1 P1 sat. Does that look familiar to you guys? Yes. Something else? Okay. So this is the pressure of the system, right? This is the this is the composition in the vapor phase. This is the saturation pressure of that component at the given temperature. And that's the that's the mole fraction in the liquid phase. Okay? So this is Routh's law. That's ideal liquid behavior and gas behavior. Okay. Now if you're operating under reasonable pressure, the, the, the uh, gas phase will usually still be ideal, but the liquid phase will often not be ideal. Okay? Why may it not be ideal? Because if you have two components, they might interact with each other in the liquid phase. Okay? So what you do is you add a correction here. You see, this looks just like Routh's law, but there's a correction here. This correction here is called the activity coefficient. Okay? This activity coefficient, which I won't go into the great, great detail for obvious reasons, can potentially depend on the composition of both components and also the temperature. Okay? So what I'm going to do is pose a set of equations where we can calculate I forget. Okay, so here's the problem. I'm going to give you the temperature and pressure of your system, but I'm going to give you the compositions of the two with the binary mixtures of two components. I'm going to give you the composition of the two components, meaning the mole fractions in the vapor phase, and I want you to calculate the mole fractions in the liquid phase. Okay? Again, we'll exploit the fact that these two phases are in equilibrium. And um, right, equilibrium. And in order to do this, if I assume the if I assume the liquid phase is ideal, I get Routh's law. If I get Routh's law, it's trivial. Just solve that equation for, for x1. Okay? If the liquid phase is not ideal, then you have to calculate these activity coefficients. These activity coefficients also depend on x1 and x2. This makes the equations nonlinear and non, and non trivial. Okay? So that's what, that's what I'm trying to impart to you. Okay? So this is the problem I'm going to set up here. Okay? I'm going to give you TP, the vapor phase compositions. I want you to calculate the liquid phase compositions. We're going to assume we know the saturation pressures because of You've heard of Antoine equation? Have you ever heard of that yet? OK. These can be calculated from Antoine's equation okay. at, a given, at a given temperature. All right. So there we are. There's the problem. And so we need to solve these set of equations. Well, at this point, all I told you is gamma is some function. I haven't told you what the function is. On the next slide, I'm going to show you what the function is. Function are these. <laughs> so girl. I know I have succeeded now. Okay. It's, it's the obligatory intimidation slide, right? All right. So this is how you calculate an activity coefficient. We shall talk about the details of this, but hopefully you can improve. So this is the equation for this activity coefficient that appeared in the first equation, the activity coefficient that appeared in the second equation. <coughs> You can see there are some parameters here. There's so-called binary interaction parameters. You can look those up for certain mixtures. But the main thing I want to impart to you is these are pretty nasty nonlinear functions of x1 and x2. Right? So you imagine somehow, you know, you could solve this, right? You could take the exponential of each side, and then you could take that gamma one thing and plug it in right there. And there's no hope to solve this thing by hand. Okay. So there you go. So there's the, that's how you calculate the, activity, the first activity coefficient. It depends on both mole fractions and the liquid phase, and then these parameters. 
which we won't really worry about. They're called the Wilson parameters. This is a, this is a particular model of how you calculate the activity coefficient, called the Wilson model. You'll learn all about it. And, and these depend on temperature. Let's say we have calculated these. We know these parameters. Okay? And you also know this is true, right? So in other words, if I give you one in the liquid phase composition, you're just going to calculate the other one by subtracting it from one. So we know they have to sum the unity. All right? So at this point, we've got this equation, this equation, this equation, this equation, and this equation. Okay? So that's five equations. All these equations are not independent. Only four of them are independent, as I'm about to show you. <coughs> and these equations have to be solved for x1 and x2, obviously. That's what we seek to compute in the first place. But we're also going to have to solve them for gamma 1 and gamma 2. So what I'm showing in the next slide is how I actually formulate the problem. Okay? There'll be a quiz on this, obviously class. We need to recapitulate this entire equation. I'm sure you can do it. And this is actually the problem you're solving on your second homework. Your second MATLAB homework consists of two parts. The first part is solving a linear algebra problem, which we used to, used to be, the second homework, MATLAB homework, used to be nothing but linear algebra. So we parred back that part a little bit, and then we gave you this, this problem. Okay, so you're going to get a chance to solve this yourself soon on MATLAB homework number two. All right? Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm doing here is the following. I'm saying, um, what is the total pressure in the system? The total pressure in the system is the contribution of component one and component two. I'm okay. assuming you've seen something like this before. Okay. And I already know what um, the pressures are here. Right? So if we go back, I'm sorry to keep moving around. So Y1P is this. So I'm just substituting in that one for Y1P and that one for Y2P, and I get this nasty, gnarly looking equation. Okay. Remember, T here is assumed to be known and constant, so it's not an unknown, but X1 and X2 are unknowns. Okay. All right, so there's one equation right there. Okay. I'm going to write down the four equations that we're going to have here. So there's equation number one. I want every equation to look like F equals zero. So I'm just going to rewrite this equation as f equals 0 by just putting everything on the left-hand side of the equation and equating it to 0, right? Just bring everything on to the left or on the right. It makes no difference. But I brought everything on the left. Rewrote that first equation like this. There's equation number 1. That's f1 equals 0. Okay? Here's the second equation. That comes from the, the fact that all fractions have to sum to unity. So again, I want to have this equal 0. I want to function equal 0. Just bring the 1 on to the left-hand side. Subtract 1 from both, both sides of the equation and get this. That's function f2. Okay. And now I have the two functions that I'm going to use to calculate the activity coefficients, which are on the previous slide, which I'm afraid I have to go back to, and I apologize. So again, I'm just going to bring everything on to the left-hand side so I can get equations that look like 0. Okay. So bring that stuff over the left-hand side, and bring that over the left-hand side, and you get these two equations here. So that's F3 and F4 equals 0. Okay? So <coughs> here's the idea. If you look at this equation, you'll see that you have four unknowns, because T is assumed to be known. Okay? The four unknowns are X1, X2, Gamma1, and Gamma2. Okay? We don't bother, in this world, it doesn't make any sense trying to solve for Gamma1 and plug it back in the equation, because it's not helpful. It can get you two equations and two unknowns, but you might as well just solve it like this. You have to solve seven nonlinear equations. It makes no difference if there's four or two or anything else. Okay. So this is very common when you set, solve set of nonlinear equations. You have the, maybe the two variables you're interested in, which are x1 and x2 in this case, and then you have two auxiliary variables. They're not things you actually care about, but they're things you have to calculate to calculate things you do care about. Okay. So I think you would agree, trying to solve this by hand would be impossible. And trying to solve it um, using the interim methods I talked about is doable, but it's pretty painful. So when you get to problems this size, you just want to use MATLAB. And I'll teach you how to solve MATLAB. Solve problems like this in MATLAB, and you'll get a chance to solve this exact problem. I can see you're excited, which is essential for success. Okay. All right, so how do we solve sets of equations like this, right? So I've given you two kind of problems here so far. I gave you this red lift long equation, right? I'm going to give you the pressure and temperature of these constants. I want you to calculate B. We agree it's a cubic equation, actually. Um, and then I gave you this four sets of equations. And I want you to solve this for x1, x2, gamma 1, gamma 2. So the question is, how do you solve equations like this? Because they're not solvable analytically. Well, 
invariably people use some form of iterative method. Okay. And so what I'm going to try to do is give you enough background on these iterative methods that you understand how they work and how you use them and why they succeed or why they fail, which ones are better than the other, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then of course, if you wanted to solve a problem like this, in reality, you would just solve it in MATLAB. You wouldn't write your own code to do this. But if you, my experience with people using MATLAB, they have no idea how MATLAB works, they can't use it well. They're like, I, I, I guessed and it, it said it, it didn't work. And I'm like, did you try another guess? No. So I mean, there, once you understand how the methods work, you can be much more functional using the, the tools in MATLAB. Okay. So let me just introduce this idea of iterative methods. So let's just say we have a single equation, a single unknown, to make it easy, like that red long equation. So a central feature of these iterative methods is the first thing you have to do is guess the answer. It may seem a little counterintuitive. I mean, how do you guess the answer if you don't know the answer? You don't. I mean, there might be good guesses and there might be bad guesses, right? If this was a mole fraction, I'd guess between 0 and 1. Right? So I mean, you might have some idea of what the answer should look like. If you have no idea, it can be hard to solve. But you have to guess the answer. Then you have an algorithm. Okay? An algorithm generates a new value x1 from your guess. The different methods are different algorithms. First thing I'm going to do is go over the fixed point algorithm. Then I'm going to go over something called newton raps and then I'm going to go over something called the CCAT method. Okay. So the iterative method, you give it x0, it gives you back a new value x1. Supposedly x1 is better than x0, closer to the solution, hopefully. Okay. And then you take the value x1 you just got and you substitute it back in this algorithm and get a value x2. And then you take x2 and plug it in and get x3. And you keep going and going and going, and you'll get a sequence that looks like this, right? Your initial guess, x1, x2, and you keep going, as long as you want to keep doing it. And I assume when you guys took calculus, you learned what a convergent sequence was, right? Um, so we're hoping this iterative process is convergent, OK? What does that mean? It means we hope that the sequence of numbers we generate by this algorithm converges in this sense, right? That if n gets really large, x stops changing. You're like, what's the alternative? The alternative is it diverges. And it, you know, so it's picture time. So by um, convergent, I mean that if you plotted, let's say, x versus the iteration here, so you start at 0, and then you have 1, and then you have 2, and then you have 3. So you guess a number here, right, and then it generates a number here, and a number here, and a number here. Eventually, you know, it stop, stops changing. It doesn't converge. It doesn't mean it converts to the right answer. It just means it stops changing. Another possibility is you guess here, and then it does this. And it just takes off. Okay? Meaning it goes, it goes it, the iteration diverges. Okay. That's not good. All right. Um, so this is what we want. We'd like this iterative algorithm we come up to be convergent in this sense. Okay. Um, but even if it's convergent in the sense I described here, you can't really afford to go to infinity. It's kind of a long time. So the idea here is usually you stop. So you have certain criteria to stop when you keep doing this. Okay. Usually I have two criteria for stopping. One is you measure how much the solution is changing from one value to another. And if this, if this difference gets really, really small, you stop. Okay. The other thing is you have a maximum number of iterations. Like think MATLAB is going to be 200. If you keep doing this 200 times, it concludes it's not going to find the answer. It just stops. And it gives you a message. And the reason going over these algorithms is so important is when MATLAB gives you some message, you can interpret it to mean it either succeeded or failed. And if it failed, why did it fail? Okay. Because what happens typically is when, when MATLAB fails for people, they don't know why it fails, and they come to me and said it failed. You know, it's like, <coughs> it's a dead end road, right? You kind of have some idea what to do about it. So, might stop this, we'll talk a little bit more. This quits changing, you know, very small amount. By small amount, well, I'll tell you what I mean later. But very small, or a maximum number of iterations. Then we'll say we're sufficiently close to the solution. So, you know, you may not be exact to 100 is a good digits, but you might be correct to 5 or 6 is good enough. Okay. All right. So, here are some issues that we would want to consider. Okay. Um, I've always wanted a slide where I ask questions, you know. 
I always make these slides where I make statements, but I thought it's going to be fun to have questions, right? And that just invokes a lot of student thought I thought myself. Okay, so here are my questions. Um, the key issues when we develop one of these algorithms is what is the algorithm? That's a no-brainer, right? At this point, I've just told you there's some magical algorithm that if we give it Xn, like X10, it will generate X11. What should that algorithm be? We're going to talk about three of them, actually. How can we ensure the algorithm works? By algorithm working, I mean it converges, right? And it converges to the right answer. The right answer means you, it's a solution to the original equation, f of x equals 0. Another question is, how do you guess that, how, how do you make this initial guess, okay? How, does, how do you go about doing this? And well, even though I'm not said here, one of the questions is going to be, how sensitive is the algorithm to initial guess? In other words, if the answer is 2 and to get it to work, you have to guess between 1.99 and 2.01. That's entirely useless, right? So you've got to be able to guess kind of far away from the answer and work for it to be useful. And then the other thing is, how are you going to stop the algorithm? So once you've gone and got sufficiently close, what's the criteria you're going to use to actually stop it? All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. We've got three different algorithms. One is fixed point, that's what we'll talk about today. It's not very, it's simple, but it's not very good, to be frank with you. And I think I'm going to go over several examples of it, when it works and when it doesn't work. Um, next time we'll talk about newton raphson That's the preferred method, in my opinion. And almost all numerical codes of any value of any significance are somehow based on this particular method. More sophisticated methods, but, but basically a variant of this. And then the secant method is actually a variant of the newton raphson method. The newton raphson method, you might imagine if I, I'll give you a problem like this. And I say, um, I want to solve the equation f of x equals 0. Right. I want to solve this equation. And, and this algorithm I'm going to come up with, it shouldn't surprise you if the algorithm requires the function f. Not in the world you're going to find a solution to f of x equals 0 if you don't use the function f. Right? So all these things use the function f, obviously. But the thing that makes newton raphson unique is that it also uses that. So it's, it, you have to give it not only the function f, but the derivative of the function f respect to the thing you're looking for. Okay. Um, this creates a lot of computing effort in many cases, as I will explain to you tomorrow, but it makes the algorithm super, super fast, and it's usually super robust, but it really works well. Okay. So all the MATLAB codes are based on some variant usually of that. And the secant method is, is a kind of a modification of the newton raphson where you don't need this information. Because you know, computing this derivative information is off, and I'll talk about it like the next time. It's computationally expensive. For small problems, it makes no difference, right? But if you get to a, like, if you get to a big problem, like a thousand equations, a thousand unknowns, then you've got to calculate what a million of these derivatives. Every function, with respect to every variable, it gets expensive. I didn't know I was playing a video in the background. Okay, that's fine. All right. So let's talk about fixed point method. Okay, so let's say you have this equation here. So you have this equation, f of x equals 0. There's many different ways to generate this fixed point algorithm that I'm going to talk about, but just consider the following. This is one of infinite number of ways. I'm going to take and add f of, I'm going to add x onto both sides of the equation. Right? I can do that if I want. Add x onto both sides of the equation. I'm going to find this new function over here.